As I explained earlier this week on this very channel, automakers spend an inordinate amount of time trying to figure out exactly how to convince car buyers that what they're selling is exactly what those buyers need to buy, rather than try and build what customers say they want. From a business point of view, this decision makes a lot of sense. Why spend time and money trying to build exactly what customers say they want, then try to figure out how to make a profit on it, when you can spend far less money building a vehicle you know you can make a killing on, than convincing customers they have to buy it. What's more, when an automaker has decided on a vehicle's design and specifications and has completed the majority of the major decisions about what the vehicle will look like, what it will include as standard from the factory, and even what its sticker price will be, it is almost unheard of for the automaker in question to then go ahead and make major changes to said vehicle. Except that's just happened, and it's something we should talk about. Last week, we covered the details of the Aptera launch edition, the first vehicle of Aptera's solar electric car lineup to come off its Southern California production line. In the last few months, we've been hearing lots of details about final vehicle design, construction, and the controversial switch from a steering wheel as found in earlier prototypes to a half steering wheel come yoke as Aptera intends to put in all of its production vehicles. But what we weren't expecting to hear during last week's reveal event was the news that the launch edition of the Aptera solar electric vehicle would not come with fast charging as standard. In fact, during the live presentation and question and answer session that followed, Aptera's co-founders Chris Anthony and Steve Fambro confirmed that while the launch edition of the Aptera would feature the North American charging standard, that's NACS, better known as the charging inlet as found on all North American market Teslas since 2012, launch edition Apteras would not include fast charging. To say this revelation caused a strong reaction would be something of an understatement. I was watching the live stream as it unveiled, and I saw lots of consternation in the live YouTube chat room as the event unfolded. And to be fair, I personally wasn't particularly pleased about the news either, because Disclaimer, I have a $100 deposit down to wait in line for my own app Terra reasons for which are highlighted in the video I will link to below. It's rare that a company listens to feedback like this when it says it's getting pretty close to production, but Aptera has, and at the start of this week, it announced it would bring fast charging to launch edition Apteras after all, making the announcement in a new video posted to its YouTube channel on Monday afternoon and followed up with an email on Tuesday. It is a rare about turn, the kind of about turn that I don't ever remember seeing before in the auto industry. So today let's examine why it happened and what it means moving forwards. First, let's remind ourselves of the reasons for not having DC fast charging as explained on Friday by Aptera. Then I will offer some observations of the same and explain why people were, I think quite rightly, ticked off by the original news. Then we'll cover how Aptera was able to about turn so quickly. Aptera's logic was, according to Fambro and Anthony, to keep things as simple as possible for the launch edition version of the company's vehicle. It was, we were told, a strategy reinforced to them by Sandy Munro of Munro & Associates. Munro is considered by many to be something of an electric vehicle production guru and has made a name for himself by not only deconstructing how companies make vehicles, providing his services to rival firms for a fee so they can better understand the competition, but also offering his industry knowledge to startups to help them become more efficient in their vehicle design and production line processes. In the case of Aptera, this focus on keeping things simple and efficient meant offering just one combination of drivetrain and battery pack all-wheel drive and a 42-ish kilowatt-hour battery pack for a claimed 400 miles, 644 kilometers of range per charge. 
Fewer production line options means fewer variations in parts, which in turn speeds up the production line and reduces initial outlay for the company producing the vehicle. On Friday, it was implied that adding fast charging would simply add extra complexity to the production process. At the same time, it was easy to infer from the presentation that Aptera's team believed that fast charging wasn't essential to their vehicle's success. Because of an ultra lightweight design and construction, even with solar panels on the roof, rear hatch and hood, not to mention a low coefficient of drag of just 0.13, which by the way, makes the Aptera the most aerodynamic vehicle ever designed for series production, the launch edition's claimed efficiency is truly astonishing. It, alongside Aptera's long-standing positive attitude towards right to repair, was in fact the reason I decided to stand in line to try and own one. And because the Aptera promises up to 10 miles per kilowatt hour, even at a fairly pedestrian charging speed of 6 or 7 kilowatts AC, that is adding upwards of 50 miles or 80 kilometers of range per hour if you plug into a standard household charging station. Compare that to say the 13 miles per hour of the Ford F-150 Lightning on that same charging station, even less for larger, less efficient vehicles like the Hummer EV, and it's plausible that for many people, Aptera was right. You might be able to get by with no fast charging at all, as long as you've got the range. Data from various sources tells us that the average American drives fewer than 30 miles a day, with all but the most remote of citizens driving more than 40 miles per day. Given that Aptera has always promoted the solar electric vehicle potential of its lineup, namely that you could drive 40 miles per day in Southern California and never charge, as long as you park outside, I can at least rationalise that sentiment even if I feel, personally, that it was a misguided one. Why do I think it was misguided? Simply put, practicality. Not every Aptera customer is going to live in sunny Southern California, and not every Aptera customer is going to use their solar electric car to do just daily driving duties. Sometimes they may want to go longer distances in it. While the vehicle is super efficient in its design and in the launch edition, it might be able to drive far further than you'd likely be comfortable driving in a single sitting, being able to stop and top off for just 10 minutes is preferable to stopping for an hour to get another 100 miles, 160 kilometers of range on board. Then there's the practicality of charging infrastructure. Modern electric vehicle charging infrastructure, road service stops on freeways and motorways, are almost exclusively targeted to cater for vehicles that can fast charge. That never used to be the case, but it has become the case. And given the decision to use NACS, but not have supercharging, it would also necessitate carrying a J1772 adapter to use all of those level two chargers that are out there and generally difficult to find. Ignoring fast charging in designing and engineering a vehicle means that customers who do want to road trip are left trying to find alternative charging stops, stops that may be less easy to reach or require more of a detour to use, as is the case for level two versus fast charging infrastructure. As someone in line to buy an Aptera, I was personally concerned, in fact, about Friday's news for that reason. One of the reasons I want to be able to own a super efficient vehicle like the Aptera is for around town errands when I don't want to take the F-150 Lightning. But the other is to make longer distance trips when we are not hauling stuff for the company in the truck. We have a family in the Midwest of the US and being able to drive pretty non-stop with two people swapping out driving is almost as quick as trying to find a last minute flight, driving to the airport, taking all kinds of detours. And honestly, it's certainly more flexible. Stopping only to pee and then hit the road again also helps cut down emergency travel time, as long as you have more than one driver, of course. And if you are traveling places where you're not safe, not having to wait while your car charges is also, frankly, a bonus. As is being able to recharge as quickly as possible when you really do need to refuel. 
Of course, there were all kinds of rumours behind the scenes and on forums that weren't confirmed or denied by Aptera, and I'm going to go into some of them here, not because I agree with them or because I think they have any kind of truth, I'm just listing them to cover some of the rumours that have been discussed. Uh, for transparency's sake, they have not been substantiated, though, by Aptera. Some people suggested that Aptera didn't want to deal with the extra cooling that would come from fast charging small capacity battery packs. The smaller the battery pack, the harder it is to fast charge it without requiring significant pack cooling. And of course, Aptera uses the body of the vehicle to keep the battery pack cool. Other people have said it was about weight saving. Eliminating fast charging means that there were fewer components in the vehicle, which in turn makes it lighter. Other people have suggested that maybe Tesla had not come to an agreement with Aptera over licensing its supercharger technology. As Kate details in this video, link below, while Tesla has made the North American charging standard available to all, access to its superchargers is still, for now, gated. Although, as of filming this, we're starting to see some evidence trickle out that that is about to imminently change. With all of that out of the way, let's discuss this about turn. I know that I'm not the only person who watched the live stream on Friday and had the reaction that I did. And on Monday, Aptera announced a 180 degree turn on fast charging, confirming that it would be included on all of its vehicles, including the launch edition. So how did it make that switch so quickly? Personally, I think the answer is twofold. First, from a financial perspective, I'm going to surmise that Aptera doesn't have the funds to deal with a large number of dissatisfied reservation holders threatening to cancel their orders because fast charging wasn't included in their vehicle. It said during Friday's presentation that it needs approximately $50 million of additional funding to reach production-ready status, and making a switch to keep its customers happy is a smart move given that need for extra extra investment. Second, Aptera said on Monday that earlier prototypes of its vehicle did include fast charging, with space on its PDU, which I assume is power delivery unit, set aside for the required fast charging components to make fast charging a reality. When Aptera thought it was going to be forced to use the CCS charge inlet, the combo plug design that all other non-Tesla EVs use in North America, that is, except the Nissan LEAF, it paused development on the fast charging elements of its vehicle, as it didn't have, quote, line of sight, end quote, to said PDU. Now Aptera has switched to NACS and says it can reintroduce DCFC to vehicle design, resuming the work it had previously paused on fast charging to bring fast charging to all Aptera launch edition models and subsequent Aptera models after that. We were told on Monday that will translate to between 40 and 60 kilowatts of DC fast charging for launch edition models, although neither Steve Fambro nor Chris Anthony would elaborate beyond that, as we can infer further engineering would need to be undertaken to get full final spec. These charging levels might feel low compared to other modern EVs, but remember, charging at 40 kilowatts would add more than 200 miles, 321 kilometers, in less than half an hour if Aptera's claimed range figures are in fact accurate. The news about DCFC might make some folks happy, and it makes me happy, but it's not quite as cut and dried as you might initially think. As Kate pointed out on that video about Tesla's NA, ACS push, it takes more than a physically identical connection to initiate fast charging at a Tesla supercharger, and there's nothing we've seen yet that tells us if that's something that Aptera has already figured out, still needs to figure out, or will instead be implementing what amounts to CCS charging using the NACS connector. What we can say, however, is that implementing what amounts to a pretty large change in vehicle design this late in its development process might be quite interesting for the team at Aptera, even if initial development work was done many months ago. For now then, 
We should be cautiously optimistic, but until I've actually seen and interacted with Aptera's solution to this problem, it is best to hold out on a final verdict. So I'm sure many of you want to know if I'm keeping my reservation. For now, I am, but I am going to admit that Aptera's need to raise extra capital before production should give everyone who has got in line a reality check on actually seeing finished production vehicles just yet. And on that note, we are done with today's video. If you liked it, you know what to do and feel free to tip us with a super thanks. The comments are open for your thoughts as is our Discord chat room, link below. If you want more, subscribe, hit the bell and follow the links to regularly support us with a YouTube membership or a Patreon subscription. You'll also find links to our Ko-fi, Bitcoin and Swag store and check us out on Mastodon. We have our own server. Scrolling on my right is a list of amazing Charged Up supporters. If your name is not there and you recently joined, we had an amazing number of people join. Please be patient, we're working on adding extra names. And shout outs go out to our self-driving tier supporters, Mike Weeder, Tony Moss, Linda Irish, Sean Tucker, Patrick Boyarski, Paul Nelson, Chris Maxwell, Brian Newton, Michael Goad, Bennett Elder, Andrew Martin, Pedro Moore Pinheiro, Brophy Wolf, Chris and Michael Johnson, Tazza and the Gong, Dan Blair, Peter Dillinger, Gordon C, Stephen O'Donoghue, Carl Hodgson, Anthony Coates, Ray Jean Fellows, Denny Hyde, Chris Ascentor and Jim Burness. Finally, out of this world, thanks to our top tier supporters, Robert Flannery, CPU Freak 101, Andrew Glenn, Anonymous Freak, JP Fagerback, Joe Bresney, John Lyons, Rory Litwin, Kevin Barrowbridge, Dave Kitchen, Aaron Hahn, Laura Reynolds, Marcel Ward, Matthew Drobnak, Paul Conway, Reggie Watts, Will Graylin, and Ian. I'll be back soon with more content as will the rest of the team, but until then, enjoy the rest of your day. Keep evolving. So I know many of you will want to know because I would want to know if I was watching this video. Yes, that is a real PowerBook 5300 in the background. Yes, it turned off, the, the display turned off while I was filming, but uh, we are, we have a small collection or I have a small collection of uh, vintage classic Macs. And one of the things I want to do moving forwards is to switch them out occasionally. Um, so you get to see some of the cool old vintage Macs that I have a love for. And I know many of you have a love for. This is real. It's not like Photoshopped or anything. In fact, I'm going to go and press a button right now so you can see that it is in fact real. So if you have an old vintage Mac that you would like us to have in the collection, um, just let us know. We'd, we'd love to offer it at home because vintage Macs are cool. It, it's a lot of my, my past. That's what I did when I was at music college to make money on the side. Norton Disc Doctor takes forever to shut things down. But yeah, that's an Aptera in the background. And it goes.